that's a fantastic question. <clears throat> Who will you invite? And so just prayerfully consider that. We're asking you to do it. And as Pastor Soraya said just a moment ago, we have one week left in our corporate church fast. And so keep going. We are in an intense season of strong pulls. Pulls on the outside. Pulls that are on the outside that affect how we think, that affect how we feel. I'm not sure about you, but for me, I find this new stay-at-home order, I had to take a really deep breath. I find it difficult. I don't I don't enjoy speaking this morning to an empty room. We don't enjoy speaking to empty campuses. The church is us gathered together, yet we know why we have to do this. But there are pulls in all of these things. There are pulls in our hearts and lives. We're living in a season of really strong pulls. As the church, we have to look oftentimes at maybe our side, which is the charismatic side, and where prophecy has been unchecked and different things have been unchecked, we can see that there's some unhealth on one side of the church. On the other side, we can also see that there's a weight that a whole generation of us now are bearing, and I should say multi-generations on another side, where the gospel is really getting, once again, interwoven with works that if I don't say everything the right way, do everything the right way, if I don't see everything your way, then there's canceling, then there's out rage and there's all of these things. I'm not talking about the issues of injustice underneath those things. It's just sometimes the things on top of it where the gospel is getting woven in once again with works and that becomes a heavy load. We are in a season of strong pulls, not even in the culture, just even within the church, but the culture has tremendous pulls as well going on. And our hearts, my heart, yours, often pull in the direction desired, not always the directed direction intended. You know, Jesus said it more eloquently when he said this, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, for where your heart is, for where what you value is, there, that's where you're going to find your heart. Where you, your values are, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to reside. And my heart, just like your heart, doesn't always reside where I desire it to be. My heart resides not where I had an intention of being. It, it's pulled by various things. And to best identify the pull, not only in the church and not only in culture, but to best identify the pull that affects our hearts and lives, we need to look at two places today. We need to look at our affections and we need to look at our afflictions. We're going to look at a story in the Old Testament and we're going to look at a story in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, there's a man named Samson. He's called by God and he's gifted by God with unbelievable strength. For Samson, he was so strong that he believed that he didn't need anyone else. If you read the story of Samson in Judges chapter 16 and 15 and 17, you'll see that over and over and over again, he does everything himself. And like Samson, each one of us today, we have things in our lives where we're strong. But every single strength comes with a unique shadow. Somewhere in our hearts where we need somebody else, of course, we need the fullness of the Spirit of God. So sometimes in our lives, where we don't have understanding around our shadows, where in our lives we don't have healthy accountability, our strengths are there, but our shadows are where our heart can begin to drift. Our affections can begin to pull us in a different direction. You know, Samson, he mistakenly believes one thing. He believes that he is the source of his true strength, not God. He believes it's in him and not a God-given gift in his life. While once again, Samson, yeah, is unbelievably strong. This is true. He is also incredibly exposed as he has no genuine relationships that we can read of in Scripture, no real accountability in his life, no one to share a blind spot or a concern, no one to look and and honestly speak truth into his life to be able to say, I think something is off here. And the Bible does a beautiful job, once again, in in Judges 15 and 16, just showing us 
these little steps, these little vows that Samson breaks, and seemingly God doesn't correct, and seemingly nobody knows, but you're seeing his character begin to drift. You're seeing his heart begin to drift. You see in Samson that whatever he desires, he pursues. Whatever the affection of his heart is, if I feel it, how can it be wrong? If it's in me and it's what I feel so strongly, then how can it be wrong? And he simply pursues it, whether it is eating out of a carcass, which was a no-no, or in other ways, which we're now about to see. Samson was a Nazarite, which meant that there were specific things that he, unlike others, couldn't do. And a pattern we see in his life is consistent unfaithfulness to his vow. And whenever he had an affection, as I said just a moment ago, he pursues it without accountability. And one day, after living this way for a while, we enter his story in Judges chapter 16. There is always a season between what we do and when we're caught or when we confess or when we're caught in what it is that we've done. And I believe that part of the move of the Holy Spirit that we're in is we're in a season of revealing. It's always easy to see something in someone else. It's hard for someone maybe, it's hard to see our own shadows and it's hard sometimes for us to hear when others speak these things. So Judges chapter 16 verse 1 says this, Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. This is Judges 16, verse 1. Continuing to read in verses 4 to 5. And after this, it says, He loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him, and see where his great strength lies. So Samson loves her. He First, he pursues her. He sleeps with her, he falls in love, so the affection of his heart is pulled, and he has no accountability, and now he's vulnerable. His faith is rooted in his own strength, his own gift, his own abilities, and he doesn't yet know it. Seduce him and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him, and we will each give you 1,100 Pieces of silver. Delilah in Hebrew means night. Samson's name in Hebrew is connected with the sun. And so in a poetic sense, the Hebrew writers want us to begin to engage here that the sun has fallen in love with the night. That there is something occurring here that shouldn't be occurring, that is ominous, that is dark, that is foreshadowing what is about to come. Samson is blind. He's not yet physically blind. That comes in a few minutes and a few chapters in the story. But he is blind to where his affections have led him. Again, he's not blind in the sense that he can't see the danger. But he's blind in that he mistakenly believes he is stronger than he really is. How many of us have got ourselves in a difficult situation, in a situation of fallenness and brokenness, because we have allowed the affections of our heart to delude us, not only to what it is that we chase, but we are in a space where we are deluded in thinking, in this space, I am stronger than I actually am, that I can do this and it won't affect me. I can engage this, but it won't lead to bondage. I can watch this, or I can speak this, or I can share this, or I can live this way. And like Samson, again, he has these little breaks of his vows, breaks of his vows, breaks of his vows. And because he's not corrected, because God doesn't come down like a heavy, he mistakenly believes that because God doesn't do that, God is okay with things. And there are some times in our lives where we can mistakenly believe in our lives that because maybe I can sing great worship songs or I know God, I have a lot of knowledge about God, that, that God is seemingly indifferent to these small things, but he isn't because affections create alignment issues in our hearts and lives. Straying from God happens one step at a time. Rarely does it happen in a single step. It does for some, but it's very, very, very minute who that happens to. Yet straying from God happens one step at a time. Samson plays with Delilah three times, not realizing that he is the one being played once again. He is blind 
in this situation. His shadow, his affection has led him to a place of blindness where he can't see. And sadly for Samson, once again, he has no one to speak into his life, to warn him, to say, this is what we can see going on in your life. It doesn't mean he would have heeded it, but at least it would have been another warning. For us as followers of Jesus, it's not about me, myself, and God. It is about, yeah, sure, there's a personal part to following Jesus. But we need others in our lives to speak not only words of affirmation and exhortation, but we also need others in our lives to speak words of love, which are words of truth. And Samson doesn't have this individual in his life. And here's what it says in Judges 16, verse 17. And he told her, he told Delilah, all his heart. And said to her, a razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now this is true. This is true that he was a Nazarite. This is true now that he has shared his whole heart. But again, It wasn't his hair that was the source of his strength. That was the lightning rod moment or the touch point on earth. It was was the blessing of God. It was the strength of God. It was that Samson was called by God to be a deliverer. It was God moving on his behalf. It was God moving in his life. The hair was just a representation of it. Yes, it was part of his vow and a very important part. And I'm I'm not trying to demean that in any which way. And there is significance to this. But part of the story of Samson that we can see is the affections of his heart that he continues to chase again and again and again is really the symptom is pride. The root, I should say, is pride that is being surfaced in his life that once again he believes that everything in his life is as a result of his strength, his ability, all of these things disregarding who God is. Judges 16 verse 17 that we read just a moment ago breaks my heart. Because it's one of the first times we see in the story of Samson that he's truly vulnerable. That he truly exposes all of his heart, the secrets of his heart. But because he doesn't have anyone who's healthy in his life, that the first time that he's genuinely vulnerable, he exposes his heart to the wrong person. Church, it's not just that you and I talk about our shadows and talk about our struggles and talk about where our affections are pulling us with anyone is that we need to, with wisdom, be able to find the right people who we can trust with the things that are really going on in our hearts and in our lives. Judges 16, verse 20 then says, And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep. And here's what he said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. And this is the most tragic line in the story. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. See what I said a moment ago. His hair is significant, yes. But it's not that he got a haircut. He didn't realize, he didn't know that the Lord had left him. You know, the Samson syndrome is alive and well today. Because for you and I, and I want to talk specifically to some amazing, amazing individuals today, but I want you to, Hear me with both ears and your whole heart. When you gave your life to Christ, that wasn't the finish line. It was the starting line. It's not just that then you get to go to heaven. You get to be with God. No, 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 no. That's living a life that is too small. It is too self-focused. Because when you gave your life to Jesus, there's now a ocean of growth for you and I to become more like Jesus. Because the more we become like Jesus, the more you and I let the affections of our heart be pulled from the things of this world and realigned to who Christ is and to be more like Jesus, then the more we make a Jesus-sized difference in the world that we live in, the more we can make a Jesus-sized difference in our singleness, in our relationships, in our marriage, in our parenting, in, in, in any which way that you want any at work, whatever it happens to be, that you and I can be used by God in an extraordinary way. So how do we align when the affections of our heart may be pulling us in this season? Well, of course, you can pursue your relationship with God. But don't pursue your relationship with God only alone. 
with other followers of Jesus, engage your relationship with God. Cultivate friendships. Cultivate people in your life who can speak truth to you, not only what you want to hear, but sometimes what you need to hear. Spoken in love, yes, but spoken in truth. And remember, you were created for more than salvation. You have spiritual gifts. You have a ministry of reconciliation. You have a God-ordained mission. You are a part of the body of Christ that we need you. We need every single member of the body of of Christ ministering and serving a lost and broken world. And so to align our affections, it requires genuine Christ-like accountability. Where are your affections drawing and leading you today? And where do you have someone who can speak not only to your strengths, but to your shadows? You know, affections, though, are only one side. The other side that we want to engage is let's talk about our afflictions. The New Testament story, Jesus has a cousin named John. And this is what Jesus says about him. Luke 7, verse 28, Jesus says, I tell you, Among those born of women, none is greater than John. That is a crazy compliment coming from Jesus. That is a massive compliment. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And John the Baptist fulfills two important Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus. As a child in the womb, John leaps At the presence of Jesus. And as a man, John sees Jesus not only as his cousin, but as his Messiah. When he says this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in the same breath, John in this moment when he sees Jesus, he ushers these prophetic words. Here's what he says. He says that Jesus, in order for Jesus to do what Jesus needs to do, Jesus has to increase and I have to decrease. But John didn't count on the decreasing that was about to come. And sometimes in this season of affliction that we're going to read that John experiences, it can be profound. Herod is a king and he is sleeping with his brother's wife. And John in his day speaks up for righteousness. He speaks up against what is occurring here. And he calls the king to repentance. John speaks truth to power. And just like it was today or then, power doesn't like it. And it goes as well as you think. To silence John, Herodias puts him in prison. And Herodias has a daughter who dances for the king, dances for Herod. And he is so moved by lust that he promises her half of his kingdom. But at the request of her mother, she denies that. And she asks for John the Baptist's head. She asks for John to be executed. And without trial, which is against the law. So this is injustice that John is experiencing. What's happening to him should not be happening to him. He is now in prison and he is awaiting execution. As I said a moment ago, experiencing profound affliction, John, who's the same one who said that I have to decrease so that Jesus might increase, now is experience a decrease that he didn't define for his heart and life. And day after day and week after week in isolation and alone, his heart begins to stir. Now remember, Jesus said, born among women, John is the greatest. John, when he was in Elizabeth's stomach as a, as a baby, when Mary approaches and, Jesus, and Mary's pregnant with Jesus, he leaps When he sees Jesus, he doesn't just see a family member. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is John. John knows who Jesus is. Yet he goes through a season of deep affliction. And his heart begins to be pulled. Because here's what he says in prison in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 3. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, about Jesus, he sent word by his disciples, by John's disciples, People were following John, so he sends them to Jesus. And said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Did you get that? John, the greatest born among women. John, 
who from his infancy knows who Jesus is. John, who knows that he has to decrease for Jesus to increase. John, who says, there's the Lamb of God who's gonna take away the sin of the world. Pinpoint clarity on who Jesus is. But in a season of affliction, in a season where things begin to push upon him, not affection, affliction, John in this season begins to doubt John, day after day, week after week, when Jesus isn't doing what John thinks Jesus should be doing, for him, his heart begins to stir. Because affliction can cause even the most devout to experience doubt. Affliction can cause even the most devout followers of Jesus to experience doubt. Experiencing doubt doesn't mean that you're not strong. Experiencing doubt means that your heart is being pulled by the afflictions of what it is that you're experiencing. It makes you human. Because life is unfair. When what God requires sometimes, when God says no to something, no, this is how you're to live, when how we want to live crosses purposes with how God His word says we're to live. In any which way in our hearts and lives, these are hard spaces of affliction. When you ask in earnestly God to zig, and it seems as though God zags, these are hard seasons when you do everything correct according to the word, that you root in Jesus. You root in and you do everything his word says. And at best, it seems like God goes silent. At best, It seems that you live with unanswered prayer when you experience a season of affliction. It affects and it pulls on our hearts because affliction can cause a destabilizing doubt to pull our hearts in a different direction. James chapter 1 verses 6 to 8 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. They are, he's a double-minded man. They are a double-minded woman. They are unstable in all their ways. There is a vast difference, church, between doubting what God is doing or isn't doing and doubting who God is. There's a vast difference between these two things. Double-minded means that you and I are torn between God and this world. We are torn between who we know God to be based on his word, not just who we desire him to be. That We are torn between who God is and what we see. Who God is and what is happening when we are torn in this space. This scripture can also touch our affections as well when we're torn between what God's word says and just what we want to do. John, the greatest according to Jesus, has been imprisoned now for over a year. You know what that means? No weekly synagogue, no community. He has to send word to his disciples. They can't come visit him. No spiritual friendships, no gatherings. Only hearing about what Jesus is doing, not experiencing it for himself. And through a pandemic... And John in prison, they can't be more dissimilar. They do have some similarities to the season that we find ourselves in. No gatherings are hard. No corporate community. No gathering even in a life group. No even just affection, a hug, a high five, a five minute prayer at the end of a service to say you're not alone. We're we're here We're here digitally. We're here. We want to reach out. But sometimes I, like you, want to scream through the camera. I want to scream. I just want to, you know, I'm not even a hugger and I want to hug. I want to wrap my arms. This is a difficult season. The sting of isolation and loneliness is very real in this season. And affliction always does one thing. When the enemy gets a hold of affliction, he has one purpose. And it's starting to be seen in the life of John here. And it can be seen in ours. Affliction seeks to align our hearts in offense towards God. Because once we become offended, Proverbs says that we become like a walled, fortified city. And the enemy knows that there's nothing he can do to separate you from God. 
But you and I, in our own decisions, in our own afflictions, can distance ourselves from him. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But that doesn't mean that you and I can't begin to push away. One of the things Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, and let's not forget this one. He says, and he, Jesus, he will become a sanctuary, and that's beautiful. But Isaiah also said he'll become a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. I'm really not sure you can follow Jesus and not go through a dark night of the soul. A season where your faith is tested. Where a trial, where you try on a trial. Not because you want to, but because you have to. But the trial comes seemingly two to three sizes too big than where your faith exists in that season, in that moment. But John does something really wise that you and I must do in seasons of affliction. We read it just a second ago. He sent word to his disciples to go ask Jesus something. Oh, hear me with both ears and your whole heart. In a season of affliction, you're never wrong when you turn with your tough questions to Jesus. When you turn to Jesus and ask him the things that are on your heart, Just like the story of Samson, be careful where you turn in a season of affliction. Be careful to whom you turn, to where you're looking for wisdom, to where you're looking for guidance, to where you're looking for these things. Be careful. Jesus gets the question from John, and here's what Jesus says. And Jesus answered them. He answers the disciples, and here's what Jesus says. Go and tell John what you see and what you hear. And now Jesus begins to quote what the only the Messiah was going to do. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And then he says these words. To, okay, all of that is, I am the Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. Like we talked about last week, where this river flows, where this coal touches, life begins to flow. And we see this in the person of Jesus. And then he ends and says this part. And blessed is the one who is not offended at me. In other words, John, I am Christ. I'm not just your cousin. I am the Messiah. I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I'm the same one who's not going to come and rescue you from prison. And now John has to rest. And here's the question. Do I trust God is who he says he is? Or does my doubt deconstruct my belief in Jesus? Do I trust God is who he said he is based in his word? Or does my doubt deconstruct my faith in who Jesus says he is? To align in our afflictions requires genuine courage to trust God is in spite of what I'm going through. Because here's what's true about outrage. And offense, because we're living in a time of outrage. Some things are outrageous, and some things we just are addicted to outrage. A statement of offense or outrage doesn't speak to whether it is true or false, it just speaks to an emotion, a belief, a perspective, or a worldview. So the presence of outrage or offense doesn't always mean an offense has taken place. Jesus has done nothing to John at all. Herod, Herodias, yeah, 
unjust trial? Yeah. Jesus has done nothing to John. And so Jesus says, I am who I am. And John, you're going to have to trust in a grander vision of the Father that you can't see in this moment. You're going to have to trust God is working all things for good when it seems like nothing is good is happening. And John, in this place, here's the danger. Remember I said with Samson, he didn't have anyone to speak truth. Jesus speaks loving truth to John by saying, John, don't become offended. Don't become outraged with me. A season of affliction can cause even the greatest to wrestle with doubt. But Jesus is our better Samson because in Jesus there is no shadow. And Jesus is our better John because when he was pressed and afflicted, Jesus said, not my will, Father, yours be done. Jesus is. The goal of this whole year of being more like Jesus, but also particular in these 21 days, Lord, make us one. Today, we're talking about making us one between the Father, but also one this way. The heart behind all of it once again is not that we become like Samson, nor do we become like John. It is that we become like Jesus. So one final question, and then we pray. Is your heart being pulled by your affections? Or is your heart being pulled in a season of affliction? In order to have Christ-like alignment, we need others to speak truth to us in seasons of affection. But in seasons of affliction, we need God to speak truth. We need God's word to be true in the person of Jesus, to speak to our hearts. Because alignment isn't just to what I think, feel, or believe. Alignment is to who Christ is. Because in Christ, all things are still possible. Together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take a moment right now when we pray for each and every one of us in this season. Father, would you, call, Holy Spirit, speak to us about our affections, the things in our lives that want to pull our heart, hearts in different directions. Lord, help us cultivate friendships in our lives where we can not only exhort one another and be encouraged, but also have truth spoken to us. Father, may we not be like Samson and blind to our behaviors. May we not think that we can cozy up with the enemy and there'll be no consequence. Align our hearts, Lord. And Father, for those who are in affliction, I take authority over words spoken over them that just because they doubt what God is doing, that they're a bad Christian, that they're, they don't get it, that they're not spiritual enough. Lord, we recognize again the difference between wondering what you're doing and doubting who you are. And so, Father, I pray for those experiencing affliction, Lord, that you'd be close in this, pandem in this pandemic season that is long and that it's difficult. God, I pray and I speak encouragement to every heart and strength in every heart, God. And Jesus, for those who are offended at you because you didn't do seemingly what you said you could do, Jesus, Speak truth to them in such a loving way as only you can through your word. And Father, help remove the wall of offense between them and you. And in this place, Lord, may we be aligned, not to the kingdom of this world, but to the kingdom of heaven. And not to the stuff of society, but to the lover of our soul. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you, and may he keep you. Have an extraordinary Sunday. Thank you for inviting us into our homes. We are praying with you. We're here. If you need anything, we are here. All right. May God keep you, and may he bless you in this season.